believe we've got almost 200 people on this uh, webinar today. Uh, and it's great to see so much interest in this important subject. We all know the importance of tackling climate change, achieving net zero, and CCUS will play such an en enormous part in helping the UK to achieve its goals. It's also a great opportunity for us. I've been chairing this working group of the Council uh, for CCUS now for almost six months, uh, and I am delighted that we're here today to present our first piece of work to you. We started back in late 2021, uh, and very quickly we decided that we needed to conduct a real assessment of what the opportunities are for UK industry. Uh, I, I should add, by the way, this, pro this process is being recorded. Uh, uh, so uh, if everyone can stay on mute uh, and raise questions towards the end, we will have a Q&A session towards the end of this. So the background to, to this work is that we decided very early on in the process that we needed to conduct an assessment of the size of the opportunity for the UK in terms of uh, be becoming part of the supply chain for the enormous CCUS opportunity. Based predominantly in the UK to start with, we believe, but then with enormous export potential too. And I'm delighted that the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, the uh, nuclear AMRC part of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, stepped forward and offered to conduct this piece of work using a methodology that they've used previously for nuclear and also for offshore renewables to help us to assess the size of the opportunity. In this webinar today, you're going to hear from Andy Storer from uh, NAMRC, who's going to take you through this report, which highlights all of those opportunities and what we believe we need to do next. You're also going to hear from Alex Millwood first from Bayes, and then you'll have an opportunity uh, to listen to a Q&A session involving some of our other uh, welcome guests on the panel this afternoon, including James Smith, who chairs the CCUS Council, Richard Warren from UK Steel, Olivia Powis from the Carbon Capture and Storage Association, and the whole event, the Q&A session will be chaired by my colleague, Ruth Herbert, who is Chief Executive of CCSA. I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to stay with you for the whole event, but it was really important to me that I came uh, and started this process and told you just how important I think this is. I think one of the interesting questions is what happens next. You will hear from Andy that we think this now needs to lead to an even bigger review of capability, looking in more depth at how we help UK manufacturing industry to develop both the capability and the confidence to step up and become part of the su supply chain for carbon capture and storage. But that's only part of the picture. We also see an opportunity to integrate that with offshore renewables, with nuclear, and all of the other energy challenges that the UK faces, and to be able to present UK manufacturing with an even bigger opportunity to be part of the energy supply chain for the whole of the UK. So I really hope that you enjoy this presentation. I hope that it inspires you to think about where you might fit in that supply chain. And I hope that you have a very interesting uh, hour and a half on this webinar this afternoon. Thank you. I'd like to hand over now to Alex Millwood from Bayes. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Dame Judith, and, and indeed for your leadership and energy in picking up this uh, working group and, and driving it to this conclusion. And, and thank you also to uh, uh, to Catapult Make UK and NAMRC uh, and CCSA for their coordinating role in, in putting it all together. Um, so, yes, I am co-program lead for CCUSA within BASE, uh, working alongside uh, actually a job share role, uh, Steph Murphy and Paro Konar. Essentially, I'm we, we govern the, the BASE part of the program uh, jointly and then within that I'm responsible for the power 
and the BEX part, as well as the transport and storage part of the program. And Steph and Paro responsible for the industrial uh, part of the program, including waste, as well as the blue hydrogen part of the program as well. So hopefully that sort of sets us in context. Um, for those who are familiar with the program, you'll have noticed you know, way back in the launch of the, the, the Prime Minister's 10 point plan back in uh, the end of 2020 and reconfirmed in the net zero strategy in the um, end of 2021, a, a key component of the, the energy benefit and the low carbon and therefore climate benefit of CCUS. Um, was uh, the economic contribution of you know, what was cited as 50,000 jobs, uh, which you know, need to sit within the, the, the supply chain. Uh, so you're very keen, uh, and I think we've, we've all learned a lot more about supply chains in the last, you know, certainly the last three to four years, where sort of just in time supply chain has been disrupted um, and, you know, we, we therefore want to you know, maximise that opportunity and get that right to both build, as Dan Judas said, this, the CCUS infrastructure here in the UK, uh, as well as then help the rest of the world achieve their CCUS ambitions as well. And you know, the, the strong um, engineering and you know, wide variety of elements of UK supply chain, both professional services, digital services, as well as the uh, sort of industrial uh, manufacturing services we'll hear more about in this starting part of the program um, from NAIMRC today. You know, it has a strong capability and reputation to go and genuinely help the world uh, achieve its CCUS goals, which the IPCC and the uh, UK's Committee for Climate Change uh, you know, have assessed is, is essential for achieving the world's net zero uh, program. Um, and you, you notice the, the start on the title that Dame Judith has was, was supply chain intervention strategy. Um, you know, we think large parts of the required supply chain is uh, highly capable, um, there's sufficient capacity, it's well plugged into what it needs to get done and, and, and the transition. Um, to launch the new industry. Uh, but there may be areas that might need a bit more help and support um, and some individual companies that might need a bit more help and support. And that can be um, in the form of coordinating, connecting, sharing knowledge such as this, et cetera. Um, and, and therefore, where, where might support best be deployed? Uh, and I genuinely think the results from this give government a, a a nice updated view. Um, you know, there's been there's been different views and progressing views of supply chain um, over uh, over the you know the duration of CCUS, and this gives a, a good current up to date view of where potential intervention may be um, best felt on behalf of us all, uh, both to make sure we can we can build that uh, UK infrastructure as well as then attain that fifty thousand jobs. Uh, benefit that, that we estimate uh, is, is the potential within the programme. Um, and we, well, I think what NAMRC has done is, is rep, whilst it's focused on a particular part of the supply chain, I think it is representative of quite a broad set of applications, particularly on the onshore capture side, which, which will be the newer components uh, and the newer demand relative to other industries um, that are in there. So I think it provides a, a really helpful guiding light. Uh, and again, um, you know, as NAMRC's role in having done this with, within other related uh, supply chains helps to provide some learnings and lessons as, as to how that can cross over uh, to other uh, energy demands and, and other similar related uh, transitions that, that are going on in the UK. Um, so, you know, very much welcome this and appreciate all of the, the effort and thought gone into it. Uh, Recognise that working with the public sector and the private sector in conjunction to the, the, the total supply chain um, you know, will be greater than the focus of this report that we're about to hear. Um, but working in together and in conjunction, uh, you know, sort of developing that to make sure that all of the component parts 
people are aware of what the opportunities are, people are equipped and uh, capable and have sufficient capacity uh, to meet uh, what we expect uh, you know, to, to be a thriving industry. And you'll all have seen sort of different reports about the size of the eventual global CCUS industry. And this, I think, gives a guiding light as to where some of those opportunities might be. So I'll, I'll pause there. Unfortunately, I can't stay very long, um, but uh, it, there's, there's a good dialogue uh, between public and private sector. And if there are any questions, you know, very happy to pick them up uh, afterwards. We work very closely with Dane Judith, CCSA, uh, and James Smith uh, and others, as you'll know. Uh, so if there are any questions, you know, please do uh, feel free to answer. And I'm handing over to Andy now, I think. Thank you, Alex. Um, I believe my slides are, there they are. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Andy Storer. I'm the Chief Executive of the Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. We, um, we undertook a study. Um, it was only a four month study, uh, just to demonstrate really the methodology that we apply in the nuclear sector. And as I'll explain as we go through, uh, we've seen results from other clean energy sectors. So why not try and reuse a method um, that's already developed and see if we can't develop something for CTUS. So thank you if I go to the next slide, please. So first of all, um, what, um, what are we trying to achieve? Well, first of all, the purpose was not really to um, get, get ultimately all the results for, uh, for CTUS. The purpose was really to demonstrate to government to uh, friends and colleagues across the CCUS sector, what a method might look like, how a supply chain uh, analysis could be completed and relevant interventions put in place. So that's what the purpose of the study was that we're launching today. I'm really pleased with the report and, and it's being launched today. Uh, why do we do that? Well, as I've already said, to try and utilize something that exists already, um, but, but also our mission in nuclear is to help UK companies win work, both domestic and international. That's manufacturing content, also um, uh, for engineering design content as well. Everybody talks about levelling up. It's not just about the north, actually, as I'll, I'll show in some maps in a second. It, will, it could help to level up and identify where there are regions that could, um, could be developed for manufacturing and also engineering content. And then, of course, it can lead to uh, export potential. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we formed a team from members of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, uh, CCSA, Make UK, and also others across the CCUS sector, specialists that have already uh, had a hand in terms of the supply chain capability and capacity. So we wanted to make sure that we incorporated that into our work as well. Thank you. So first of all, what, what is fit for nuclear? Um, well, it's a free online assessment, first of all, where a company can go online, complete a diagnostic on our website. Um, and if the company is interested in certain scope in the nuclear sector, and if we think that their capability would meet uh, that scope of work, then we'll go out and conduct a site visit. We've got specialists around the country. We'll go and see the company, look at their aspirations, look at their systems, their ways of working, and we'll match that with the nuclear sector and the requirements of the nuclear sector. Very conscious that that may be slightly different to other sectors, but uh, quite frankly, I, I think it's, um, it's business basic really at this point. Um, health and safety, quality systems and processes, et cetera. Uh, and then we get into uh, reporting of how, what interventions might be required and how the company might go and um, win opportunity. Some of that will be systems and processes. Some of it will be specific. To the product or the system that they're trying they're interested in and their skill set might align to so we then look at the company and we try and align with the customer where they could fit the best uh, and then we work an action plan with our experts and the company uh, and agree a roadmap that roadmap is then owned by the company and it's up to the company to decide on the pace at which they go uh, and complete that roadmap um, we provide ongoing support to the company we have to leave them and uh, we then complete an assessment of the company. And when the company is deemed, in our eyes, fit for nuclear, we we grant them a certificate, which works with the company as well, the customer as well, on their approved vendor list to help the customer assess the supply chain. 
We've got about 120 companies in nuclear today that we would call granted. However, we are working with over 3,000 uh, companies. There's, a, there's over 1,000 that have taken that first step, that online self-assessment. But we've got a network of over 3,000, mainly SMEs across Britain, across all 36 LEPs, which is quite important when I go further in, this, in the presentation. Uh, but those 120 companies have told us that that's resulted in just shy of £2 billion of contracts won as a direct result of, of, nuclear, uh, of the fit for nuclear, sorry, the fit for nuclear intervention. So we're quite proud of it. It's been going nearly 10 years now. So it's quite mature and well established. Uh, thank you. Next slide. So what did we do? We set up a team. The team you can see there, it's quite a busy chart. Apologies for that. But um, around the nuclear MRC, you can see Make UK, Government, Bayes, Catapult and CCSA. So we kind of formed the leadership governance with the centres from the, the, uh, the AFRC on the left-hand side there, right across to the Manufacturing Technology Centre on the right, and then sector-specific advisors. So we formed quite a good uh, team from the Catapult and Make UK Government and CCSA. Uh, that was intentional because this, these are the teams that work a lot across manufacturing scope, so have a good handle on the manufacturing capability and capacity. Um, I said it was a four month sprint, really. It was never going to be the, it's not the full finished article. It doesn't claim to be. So please don't ask a question about where this is or why that's missing. Um, it was to show and demonstrate the method. And the method's been demonstrated, as Judith Hackett said at the start of this on the right hand side. Fit for Nuclear is circa 10 years old. We then launched Fit for Offshore Renewables with that catapult. And there's uh, about 150 companies that we're working with now on Fit for Offshore. Uh, we took the liberty of uh, a logo of fit for CCUS uh, and we're, we're working with an Equinor with Zero Carbon Humber uh, on various other projects which could all culminate in fit for hydrogen. So, you know, we're trying to use something that exists already, something that's proven, nearly £2 billion of contracts won. The method works. It works across the Catapult network. And so why not use it in other, um, another part of the clean energy sector and carbon capture? Thank you. Um, this chart's a little blurred, so apologies, it's, it is on my screen anyway, but I'm not going to try and preach to anybody about the opportunities here, because I would imagine most people on the call either know that already, or they can certainly get that from the panel discussion later. I'm, my role here is to present what we've completed and, and the methodology. What we've got here is a map of Britain with opportunities uh, identified and sites identified in, with the blue uh, markers there, the blue rings or ovals. We'll come back to that in a second, but that's the, the demand. That's the demand for the supply chain. They're the regions where it's likely uh, carbon capture will be uh, established. Thank you. What we did was um, map really the scope of CCUS against high value in pounds and then level of equipment speciality, in other words, complexity and difficulty, and therefore exportability really, you know, um, what drives high value jobs and, and uh, manufacturing. Not to say that the other areas aren't important, of course, but we had to find a way of, um, a way of uh, picking uh, priority areas for this study. Again, this was not the full, um, uh, this is not the full study, this was a, to, to select certain products to demonstrate the method. So from this, from the right-hand side there, the top right corner side, we picked the high value impact and highly specialized equipment. So we picked the amine, treatment recovery system. So if we go to the next chart, please. And here you can see um, 11 products uh, listed. Uh, the color coding I'll, I'll explain in a second. So the amber is um, you know, capable of, of getting there. The, the companies, uh, we have gaps in some of those products, some of those areas, um, whether it's we haven't got many manufacturers. Uh, so, it's, so is the supply chain stable and sustainable or do we understand the product sufficiently and the design and do we have the manufacturing methods and equipment to produce the products <clears throat> in a sustainable way so this capability experience and the readiness of the supply chain so amber is it will require quite a push but could get there green is it's it's quite solid today but doesn't mean that it won't require continued investment because supply chains can disappear, of course, um, and, and change. So it's a constant um, 
assessment to make sure that it's, it's sustainable. Uh, the good news is there's no reds on this on this particular system. There is a grey, which is that we just needed more information on that one particular product, so we didn't have time to complete that fully, but uh, that can be done quite simply. So this is just one system on that top right hand side of the four box there, just to demonstrate the method um, of what we think the UK is capable of from a capacity capability point of view. And capacity, just to explain that, is the scale of manufacturing uh, ability in people and in uh, facilities, whereas capability is the know-how. The ability to the, the knowledge of how to manufacture pumps, heat exchangers, etc. Thank you. So um, another slightly blurred map. Apologies of Britain, but um, the components are down the key on the left hand side there. So you can see um, towers across Britain, um, and those towers represent. If we take Teesside for instance, I think is one of the tallest towers. Um, around that region anyway, um, you can see that one, two, three, four, five, five of those products, the capability exists in that region to manufacture, produce those products. Whereas in some other regions, there are quite low towers or worse still, no capability that we identified through our database. Bear in mind, this is using our database with Make UK, Nuclear MRC and the Catapult. Uh, in our database, companies were either not capable or, or didn't exist. So if we just click, it should show, um, if we click again, please. No, it doesn't. Okay, sorry, if you go back then slightly, sorry. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted. So you can see the sites again now. So the way we work with local enterprise partners, the, across all 36 local enterprise partners, you can see there in South Wales, that there could be quite a demand for CTUS but not a lot of uh, manufacturing capability that could um, meet up with the, the required demand. Likewise, Southampton on the south coast. This isn't about levelling up uh, just north. This is about looking at how we can level up the, the capability and capacity across Britain. Um, of course, there's lots of demand north as well where there's a need. Um, so this is where Nuclear MRC would now work with uh, the LEP to look at specific interventions in that region, say South Wales or South of England, and gauge the appetite of the local enterprise partner to invest in the supply chain and also in the supply chain companies that are there if they want to make the leap into this, this uh, sector. That doesn't mean to say, of course, that companies that exist through the middle of England there, uh, up to the north of England, that they couldn't, of course, deliver products for the South, South Wales, etc. So it's about looking at where the skills are the opportunity locally, of course, is could be great, but we shouldn't duplicate the capabilities to make sure that we uh, harness the capabilities that exist across the country and, and utilise that as much as possible. Thank you. So this is um, this, this is the supply chain database of Nuclear MRC um, for a nuclear ap application. But you can see if you take South Wales, and the south of England, there's two examples I just pulled out just now. You can see quite a bit of capability or companies that we are working with in fit for nuclear. So, in our opinion, my assertion, our assertion is that it wouldn't take too much to work with those companies and those labs to bring more uh, capability into those regions to meet up with these uh, CCUS demands. But right now, going back to that immune system and that list of products, uh, we, we don't see a lot of capability in those particular regions, but we do in others. But we think that Britain could um, match up quite well. Whilst it's got some ambers, uh, it would need specific intervention. There, there's no reds, right? So that's the good news. We can we can step in and uh, deliver a lot of this product um, from this from this island. And then, of course, that gives us a great export opportunity, as Dame Judy said at the front end. If we're taking some of these high end, highly specialised products, where other countries would be, uh, in our opinion. Uh, found wanting uh, even more than, uh, than than Britain. Thank you. So just to um, summarise, we think really the FitFor program works. It works well. We think the study that we've uh, got engaged in with those partner organisations has worked really well. It's been a good journey for I think all organisations to get to know each other, but also to demonstrate the method works. So we think. Uh, a similar program, similar to Fit for Nuclear, but a full program, a program that isn't just a four-month uh, sprint, 
there is actually a considerable program that then looks at not just the demand side and the capability and capacity analysis, but then looks for the next step, which is the intervention. The intervention to get those companies match fit, to get more companies in the system, to ensure that the supply chain is sustainable and that we can deliver 80 plus 90 percent of the scope from Britain, uh, if not all of the scope from Britain. Um, so that's the first um, recommendation. Also, we found that manufacturing process improvement uh, could be enhanced. That would improve competitiveness of the, the supply chain in, in the country. We, we found through Fit for Nuclear that whilst we've got a lot of capability in Britain, it's been, it's been um, developed for the defence programme or existing uh, um, programmes, uh, government programmes, which um, may not make it the most um, competitive when you, when you look at the open market, as we're trying to do now in, in nuclear. So uh, we are looking at manufacturing processes and how we can take uh, some waste out and uh, make more efficient use of capability and capacity. So there is a competitiveness angle there that we've spotted that we think um, would be good for next steps. We, we believe that um, government should fund, uh, as I said, as a full scale um, CCUS program um, to make sure that uh, we don't miss the opportunity. It's very easy to sleepwalk into these things uh, and miss the opportunity. The supply chain needs help. It should get help uh, so that Britain can capture the opportunity for domestic wins, but also international opportunity. And the last point really is, as a, it's quite an obvious observation, but if you look at the right hand side of nuclear, offshore renewables, CCUS, hydrogen, and others that are, that are emerging as um, clean energy, uh, then would it not make sense actually to go further than having a fit for nuclear, fit for offshore, fit for CCUS, actually have a fit for clean energy programme? Because the supply chain in some areas, heat exchanges for a nuclear plant and heat exchanges for CCUS hydrogen plant, yes, they're different regulations, but they're still highly regulated. They're still um, robust products. And if, the, and if the supply chain is making a heat exchanger for a, a part of the energy sector, then we should consider that supply chain able to make it for another part. So to me, to us as Nuclear MRC, we believe that actually a fit for energy programme would be um, a fantastic development. And so I recommend as a last point to government colleagues and to the CCUS sector, that considering CCUS as part of a wider fit for energy would be something that um, could be uh, considered. I think that's it from me. So uh, thank you for listening and hope that was useful. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andy. And um, I'm taking it from here, I believe. And uh, my name's Ruth Herbert. I'm the CEO of the Carbon Capture and Storage Association. Uh, and we've been involved in this work and supporting Andy and the team uh, throughout the process. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to now uh, introduce our uh, team of panelists so that we can discuss uh, some of the stuff we've just heard from Andy. And I'm sure also hear a lot of questions from all of you online, um, which we will uh, look forward to debating. So um, I'm just going to, to ask all the panelists to turn on their videos for a moment, uh, and I'm going to introduce them one at a time and ask them just for a couple of minutes of reflections on what they've heard this morning so far from Dame Judith, Alex Millward and, and Andy Storer. So um, our first panelist is uh, James Smith, CBE. Uh, James is the co-chair of the CCUS Council alongside Minister Hans. Um, he had an early career in accounting before moving into upstream oil and gas um, with an, a number of senior roles within Shell and in 2004 was appointed the chairman of Shell. Um, just as energy and climate change issues were becoming acute, um, he has, uh, was president of the Energy Institute, chair of the advisory board of the University of Cambridge programme for sustainability leadership, and has also held board and advisory positions with the Grantham Institute and the Carbon Trust. So we're really delighted to have James with us to give us his reflections on supply chain issues relating to CCUS. Uh, hello, James. Hi, Ruth. Uh, many thanks. And thanks to everyone for joining our conference today. And, and thanks to uh, Judith and Andy and all that work with them for the really outstanding work that's been done because on the CCUS Council of Supply Chains has been a, a key theme for us for, for some while. And seeing this sort of 
progress and the opportunities that they've created for us has been really heartening, heartening and stimulating. Um, if I could just say a word or two more of context in the first instance, and um, uh, to start off by observing, and I think we all know the IPCC yesterday published their assessment report on the impacts of climate change. You know, there are three assessment reports at the moment, one still to come on technologies that I'm looking forward to. But yesterday's assessment confirms, as I think we all feared, that the impacts will be sooner and the impacts will also be more severe than we had feared. Uh, so that gives real urgency to net zero because I think, as we all know, at present rates of emission, 1.5 degrees emission budget, our emission budget for staying within 1.5 degrees will be fully consumed by around 2030. That's a frightening prospect. So it significantly concentrates our minds. A huge amount needs to be done in what is now an extremely short period of time. And that includes CCUS because we know it's essential for beating climate change. And I think we're all wishing we'd started much sooner than we are. Um, in the UK, CCUS and hydrogen together will require, according to estimates that CCSA was making, in the region of about 100 billion pounds of investment by mid-century. We can just remind ourselves that that's about the scale of H2S, uh, but a lot more complex and technological. For net zero as a whole, the investment in the UK is probably of the order of a trillion by then, by mid-century. That's 10 times H2S and infinitely more complex. So against that background, supply chains are important for, for two reasons. First, we just need excellent supply chains to deliver a highly efficient net zero energy system on time and on budget that really works. And I suspect there are a lot of people involved in this call who are involved in delivering complex projects and they know how difficult it is to bring complex budgets home on time and on budget and really working the way that we wanted them to do and yet in this case it's probably the biggest challenge we've got and it's the most important that it really does work on time the stakes couldn't be higher but also on that uh, we have in the UK now in a unique opportunity um, and it really is you know, an opportunity that will not arise very often at all to be world leaders in a crucial low carbon technologies. Um, so time's of the essence, I think, for us to implement a, a, an ambitious vision for what I might call a low carbon industrial revolution that would create tens of thousands of skilled, satisfying, well-paid jobs for the UK. And the UK and all its regions needs to grasp the opportunity to be able to secure significant proportions of the global value added from investment in low carbon technology. I said it's a trillion pounds to 2050 in the, for the UK, but globally, of course, I think we're all aware it's probably a trillion dollars a year. The UK's involvement in all of that, to my mind, is both a significant duty, really important for beating climate change, and also presents a huge opportunity for the UK. And that's what I'm looking forward to discussing with you all further this afternoon. Thank you, James. Uh, really good scene setting there. Um, I'd like to now invite Rebecca Groundwater, who's the Head of External Affairs at the EIC, to give her reflections. Rebecca is, uh, has spent the majority of working life in politics, working for politicians and ministers in Westminster, Holyrood and Brussels, and working on electric election campaigns and shaping policy. But for the far last four years, she's worked for trade associations within the sector and is now heading up the EIC's lobbying work. So Rebecca, um, uh, give us your take on, on what you've heard this morning. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with, with James. I, I think it's a, a very exciting opportunity and, and the opportunities which are set out in the report show what our UK-based supply chain can get behind and, and that ability to have the first mover status. We know how important that is and we know that we need to get after it. And having, having this, this report which sets out what we actually need to do and has brought numerous people together in order to do that, I think sends a very strong message and helps highlight what we need to do and how quickly. And it, it's that ability to pivot and turn 
that will help us grow our exports as well, something which we're, we're very passionate about. And we see other countries moving towards this. We know that there's lots of, you know, that, that movement towards net zero and, and the, the, the next COP session and what that means and how we can get there. And we know that we have a very talented supply chain. We know that we have moved before and we know what we need to get after. And I think the opportunities set out in the report um, that help highlight what we need to do that, it, it's that unique opportunity to be world leaders and have that first footer status. And looking across it from all energy sectors, I think helps tie that together, um, especially at the EIC, we, we work across all energy technologies. So being able to, to see that um, in the report as well and realize that it's not one versus another, but actually there is that capability and the capacity to draw others in and to diversify our existing work and our existing companies and help them move into sectors to help reach that capacity piece. I think it's a very, it's a very powerful message. And it was, um, it was really exciting to read and to see that actually, yes, we're all moving together towards this journey and having it set out in that way. So I think, um, yes, fully support what James said. I don't want to repeat it all, so I'll, I'll probably stop there. Thanks, Rebecca. And we'll obviously discuss more during, during the Q&A. Um, so next up is... Um, CCSA's very own Olivia Powis, head of our UK office. Uh, and uh, before joining CCSA, Olivia was a senior policy manager at the National Infrastructure Commission. And prior to that, she spent uh, seven years off German energy regulation, policy development and strategic comms. So um, Olivia, CCSA, as I know well, has been very much involved in this work. But is there anything you'd like to add to what you've heard before we, we go into the Q&A? Yep, thank you, and uh, and thanks for inviting me to speak today at the at the launch of this document. Um, as uh, Ruth introduced, I'm I'm head of the UK office at the Carbon Capture and Storage Association, and we work with members, governments, and other organisations to ensure CCUS is developed and deployed at the pace um, and scale necessary to meet the net zero goals and deliver sustainable growth across uh, regions and nations. Uh, as is mentioned in the um, in the document itself, the CCSA published the Supply Chain Excellence Report last July uh, to provide a high level estimate of the size um, of the potential opportunity for the CCUS and hydrogen supply chain. Um, and we estimated in that that uh, the size of the supply chain required for net zero to be around 41 billion pounds by 2035, uh, with most of that expenditure uh, to be onshore of deployment of CCUS and hydrogen onshore, around 85% of the expenditure to be onshore, which would maximize the use of the UK strong uh, EPC sector. And we also estimated that the offshore expenditure would be around five billion pounds uh, on offshore transportation and uh, storage projects and noted the UK's existing skills and capabilities in this area uh, work that the, the North Sea transition deal is now taking forward. Um, and so the study published today by the NAMRC focused on one uh, type of capture technology as part of that onshore expend expenditure. And they selected it as, a, as they considered it to be a high value impact and high uh, speciality technology and as a potential area for manufacturing um, R&D in the UK uh, equipment. Um, but we also know there are other capture, other capture technologies that are already developed in the UK. And as we saw from the tables Andy presented today, uh, we have capability and experience in a number of areas. And with the right help um, and timely intervention and support, we could be enabled to, to be ready to support the deployment of the UK CCUS industry. Um, and I think, you know, as, as Andy has said, and we've heard from everyone really to, to fully exploit the opportunity and maximize uh, the social and economic benefits to the UK population, we need to be able to offer timely delivery of, uh, of, of high quality products and services at high volume. Um, so really, I think one of the the key points uh, that we need to focus on and, and take away and, and was highlighted both in our report in the supply chain excellence report and also in today's report um, and that in order to meet uh, the net zero targets 
uh, the UK will need and is able to lay down new plants at a reasonably uh, linear rate out to 2050 requiring and we need lots of projects to be built in quick succession and this long pipeline of uh, design and construction work is going to be what's required for the supply chain to give them confidence that there's a, a steady and secure stream of work. Um, and there's also significant opportunity and, and this uh, report didn't focus on it, but it's, it's really important to consider the um, operational opportunities and the ability to offer high uh, quality long-term jobs, uh, both in engineering side, uh, also uh, digitalization. There was a lot of discussion on this yesterday at the CCUS Council. Um, and, and these jobs will largely be based in the industrial areas and make a significant contribution to leveling up. Um, so I think, you know, with to maximize the opportunity, we, we really need to move quickly. And I've just wanted to finish by highlighting uh, three key areas that, uh, so as an industry, we need to really collectively coordinate, I think, all the existing work um, in this area and to establish a coherent uh, picture of the, of the capability and capacity. And then secondly, we need to communicate this clearly to the supply chain uh, so that everyone in, uh, involved in the supply chain can understand how and, and when best uh, to get involved. And thirdly, we need government to support a clear pipeline of projects out to 2035 and beyond to give the supply chain industry the confidence that there'll be long-term opportunities and, and to be able to provide uh, the case for investment. Uh, I think I'll stop there and, and look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. That was really clear and I completely agree. Uh, I spent a lot of time yesterday talking about the need, obviously, for this, this ramping up and for that to be steady and uh, assured for people to, to invest in the supply chain. Um, so Richard Warren is our is our final panelist to be introduced. He's the head of policy and external affairs at UK Steel, heading up their development of policy positions and interactions with government. Uh, prior to this, he worked in a number of roles representing the manufacturing sector, sectors on issues of energy, climate change and environment policy. So welcome, Richard. Steel is a, a sector that we've been talking about. Um, so your views on this are very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Ruth. And it's uh, yeah, fantastic to be on the panel today um, and speaking about this report um, about how we can uh, build a domestic supply chain for uh, carbon capture and storage here in the UK. Uh, I mean, to state the obvious to a certain extent, um, CCS is important to the steel sector for a couple of reasons. Not least, um, it is one of the principal routes to decarbonisation uh, for the steel sector. Um, a big chunk of those 9 million tonnes of captured industrial emissions that the government is targeting for the middle of the next decade are likely to come from the steel sector. Um, and obviously, one of our primary, primary steel productions at Scunthorpe is sitting right in the middle of the, the Humber industrial cluster. Um, probably more relevant for today's uh, discussions is obviously, and today's uh, report, is um, the important market opportunity actually that CCUS uh, presents for the steel sector. And obviously there's a particularly steel intensive part of that is the pipelines um, both on and offshore um, for the steel sector. And half my job has already been done for me. One of the comments uh, in the, uh, the chat already indicates actually we do have very good capability um, in this area already. So whilst um, the AMRC report didn't have time to look into that, actually this is an area where we already do have uh, capability um, and there is significant potential for UK steel producers. Um, just you know, some of the work the steel sector has been doing in recent months, um, trying to pull together perhaps what the demand would be um, for steel, just of the first two cluster projects, uh, both the CO2 and hydrogen, I do think it's important to include those together because uh, they will to a certain extent be developed together they are clearly very closely related and a lot of the steel requirements um, will there will be a huge amount of crossover we're looking at something in the region of 400 kil kil kilometers of steel uh, tubes and piping um, which is you know perhaps over 150,000 tons that is a pretty big chunk of, uh, of steel demand um, and as said, we are very well placed already to meet that demand uh, with two UK producers um, based in Hartlepool, both Tata and Liberty um, Steel, um, both of which representatives are um, taking part in this event today. Uh, and there's naturally crossover from where they're supplying now into North Sea oil and gas 
and not least in the demanding conditions that those pipelines must be made to withstand and the specialist coating corrosion resistance um, coatings uh, that need to be applied to the steel. Um, importantly for the steel sector, um, CCUS and hydrogen, they, in doing so, they represent a really key opportunity for the green transition for us. As demand for um, tubes and pipes for oil and gas, uh, both here and, and abroad, declines over the next decade as we move away from fossil fuel, um, they will be replaced to a significant degree by the new opportunity actually represented by uh, CCUS and hydrogen. If the right approach is taken, you know, hundreds of jobs in the steel sector and in related supply chains that are currently servicing the fossil fuel sector can actually transition smoothly into servicing new net zero uh, jobs. And that's a really critical point for the steel sector. So whilst much of the focus around the green transition and net zero is all about the creation of new jobs, Actually, for sectors like steel, we are very much looking at the maintenance of the thousands of jobs we already provide and the transition of them away from supplying perhaps more carbon intensive industries to new sectors like, um, um, like CCUS. So I would just finish by saying that um, early work like this report and some of the work that obviously the uh, uh, Carbon Capture and Storage Association has already done is hugely encouraging the active thoughts and considerations being given now on how we can build that, um, that supply chain. Uh, this is something that I think was really missing in the offshore wind to the fact that the majority of the materials and the equipment, certainly in the early uh, days of offshore wind, were really imported. And that was a really big missed opportunity, certainly from the point of view of the steel sector. Uh, this is slowly changing in the offshore uh, wind sector. But I think we've got a real opportunity here, as everyone on the, uh, uh, the call has already said, to get the policy right, to take the right approach and actually make sure that we develop um, a properly domestic supply chain, providing all those jobs and that economic opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I've got a, there are a few questions uh, arising already in the chat, which is great. Um, so um, we can come to those um, shortly, um, I guess. Uh, I just got a few here that I wanted really to, to put to you. I think um, it's great to hear about the opportunity. And I think you've all kind of reinforced that with what you've been saying, I suppose. And we'll come on to some of the questions in the chat, I think, that relate a, bit, a little bit to, to the barriers. What, what are the biggest barriers here? You talked about a few, Richard, um, but, but in a way, I think addressing, removing barriers is actually really what I think was to the heart of Andrew's recommendations really about how do we how do we do that um, and I suppose who needs to take action and, and what is the next step in in re relation to this report so I just wanted perhaps to ask James and then come back to Richard on that and Richard specifically for you I think there's a comment in the chat about you know the readiness of the industry particularly in the in terms of pipelines uh, uh, to actually provide the pipelines for carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, but they're mentioning import tariffs here as being a challenge. So uh, have a think about how you, you might want to react to that one. But James, it, what do you view as, as the barriers here? And how do you, what do you think are the priority actions in terms of next steps? I'll do my best to respond to that. I, I, as I was listening to the other introductory speakers, I was also trying to read the chat as well. And uh, I, and, and it reminds me, of course, something I meant to say at the start really should have. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of in broadcast mode, but I mean, among the participants in this, there are people with a huge amount of experience to contribute to this discussion. So the chat itself is very valuable. And I think maintaining the contacts with the people who are uh, in this discussion for the work we still have to do is going to be extremely important too, because clearly a great deal of experience and knowledge there. I mean, one thing just to start with, um, it's kind of a statement of the obvious, but perhaps, uh, perhaps everyone knows it, because the supply chain um, that we need to deploy CCUS and hydrogen um, has existed for a very, very long time, and it's there to be deployed at pace when the market conditions create the right incentives, because that supply chain is the large scale process engineering supply chain for the world's oil and gas and petrochemical industries. Um, and that supply chain has been processing, separating, transporting fluids, including carbon dioxide and hydrogen for, well, getting on for 100 years 
I suppose. And just to observe that a few years ago in the UK oil and gas, the supply chain delivered about 20 billion pounds of work. Uh, and that's far, far larger than the annual amount of work that's going to be needed for CCUS and hydrogen. So there's a serious positive there about getting the mitigation done because we have and there's some frustration to my mind as well. Why didn't we, why weren't we able to start a long time ago? And then given the long-term residency in the atmosphere of CO2, there'd be stuff in the atmosphere now that wouldn't have been there if we got started some while ago. But that leaves, you know, it's certainly good news in itself. We can do it. Um, we can get the mitigation done at least starting now. But of course, there's a gaping hole in that question. How many of the high-scale, well-paid jobs and the value added will remain in the UK? Because I guess that's fundamentally what your question. And I think there are significant barriers. And if we leave it to the status quo or even you know, a little bit enhanced status quo, so there's a question of ambition here. Yes, we'll do really well in certain areas, engineering services, some other specific areas that have been mentioned. And in a conversation about this yesterday, people were talking about digitization and IT and how outstandingly good we are in this country. So it's true um, that we have a, a lot of sectors, subsectors that will benefit from this and won't need much help to do so. And we'll be world leaving, leading. But if we don't do something pretty significant, uh, I don't think we'll achieve anything like we would want in areas like high tech, high value added manufacturing, particularly in areas of advanced steel fabrication and about rotating equipment, all of which I know figure in the thinking that Andy and others have been doing. So you asked about impediments. Well, of course, the initial impediment is the intense international competition that there's going to be uh, and the existing industrial base that we have you know, highly skilled people, very able people, uh, but we don't have the economies of scale. Um, and in some cases, technological sophistication that will enable us to gain the kind of market share uh, that both the in the domestic and global markets that we, we would want. Um, and therefore, getting to the heart of your question, what do we do? I kind of guess I'd characterize it as we can be reasonable or we can be unreasonable. Um, and if we're reasonable, we'll probably polish the status quo and ultimately be a bit disappointed. Um, if we're unreasonable uh, and a bit uncompromising, uh, we'll create for ourselves a, a future vision. Uh, and that future vision will be of an industrial base taking advantage of the huge national and even huger international uh, investments that are going to be made and the UK industrial base will be a much greater scale and sophistication than it is now in, in sectors that we will identify and we'll work out for ourselves how we can get from where we are now to that future vision. We'll look at what other countries, I mean and we all know them, Japan, South Korea, Germany, Switzerland, Finland, others, what they did and we'll again be convinced that it really takes concerted effort and realistically a long period of time to get it. And we'll also recognize that British industry is going to invest in the scale and get the sufficient sophistication that's needed. There must be a large winnable pipeline available. And that means actual project, progress with projects and a belief that it will all happen. And it will happen not in fits and starts and disappointments, but it'll all happen at scale for a long time. Um, it also means, I think, that we've got to consider things like contracting strategies that will stimulate us to build at scale and invest in new technologies and learn by doing. And that probably means thinking beyond individual companies, uh, that companies who exist today need to start thinking about consortia so that they can build scale possibly with international partners, but with the infrastructure and the capability onshore in the UK. And I think thinking in those terms probably means cooperative action involving project owners, uh, the supply chain in all its forms and government agencies. Now you might be thinking I'm trying to reinvent <laughs> central planning, um, but just to be clear, I'm not suggesting we do it the that way, I still believe very strongly in competitive markets. But we need to find the right balance between getting the best out of competition 
and ensuring we can create those economies of scale by creating big enough, long-term enough contracts that people can be incentivized to build those new facilities with the best available technologies. Um, and I'm just looking again at Andy's talk, as I saw it yesterday as well. And I think, Andy, your um, matrix, your traffic light matrix, begins to enable us to home in on those areas where there are sectors where there may be amber rather than green. And we asked to ask, can the red ones become amber and the, uh, the amber ones become green by maybe doing more than just working with the individual companies? Can we find ways of concerted action by those companies, like I say, consortia, and by the owners of the contracts to build the sort of opportunities that really will enable us to do what others of our international competitors have, have done in the, the past. Uh, we actually did it, something like that, in the first phase of oil and gas development in the 70s and 80s. It was successful then, and I think we need to create a modern equivalent uh, of that. At the moment, getting back to Barrage, I don't know that we've got the institutional architecture in place at the moment to get that done. And Andy, you said to us, do we want four different fits or do we want one overall fit that really does look at things in a big sector sense? And as people have said, it's about skills as well. And skills are going to be across the whole of our industrial base and segmenting the problem into smaller pieces runs the risk that we sub-optimize and don't get the scale that we want. I've gone on a bit, but I think Dean Judas and Andy Storer's work so far can be a real kernel for the sort of ambitious thinking that I believe we need to do. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, maybe, um, maybe before I come to Richard, just get Rebecca's views on this as well, because obviously the EIC are looking across the energy industry. So just picking on the, up on that theme about needing to look as broadly as possible at this. Um, how, how does the work you're doing, I guess, help the industry to, to see a coherent plan of what will be required and when? And um, maybe just your thoughts on, uh, I guess, your next steps around that and how I suppose this work fits into that wider picture. Thank you. In terms of, of enabling the supply chain, um, we we have a wealth of, of market data of research that shows where the global capex is what's coming where and when and what we're seeing is that that globally the 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 talk is moving into ccus hydrogen but the majority is still oil and gas in the uk we have targets and we we know potentially what's coming but we have nothing hard and fast yet. We're not at the, the, the clear pipeline with the, the feed in details, which will allow the supply chain to actually invest and develop that those those skills which are required. And that's the difficulty. We've we've held a number of discussions recently. Um, I think Andy, you may have been on some of them around the investment needed to help supply chains move into different areas and how that that works and unless that's there and they can see the value of what's coming what we find is that they move out of the energy sector because the the, the longer term planning isn't there it's not secure so what we are looking to do is work with it's the local content it's where can we develop our own capacity and how do we bring in the regions and the clusters and tie it all together. And that, that way of working it is much more powerful and it's enabling the supply chain that we have to actually be competitive and take them with us. Thanks, Rebecca. We have a question here um, from Gerald Mulvaney that the UK is suffering significant skills shortage for construction and manufacturing. How does the panel believe this can credibly be improved? Um, would anyone like to come in on, on that one? I guess someone's got it. I'll try and give it a go. I mean, uh, Olivia, are you? Uh, Olivia. Uh, the, uh, I don't know if there's anyone on, online from the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board, which to my mind is a very 
important organization. And uh, when in the CSA, CCSA was doing work on this earlier, the, the ECITB were heavily involved. And I, uh, going back to Andy and what he's proposing for the future, I would see the ECITB being a very significant player in developing the work further. Um, I think we have in the UK the capacity to, to impart the skills. Certainly true, the skills do exist. We just don't have enough people and enough work for them to do. So it's, it is going to be a, a combination of, um, I think, giving confidence to people that the um, that pipeline of projects is really going to be there. So that that's something that's been repeated by a number of us already. So if I was sort of leaving school and thinking about a career, and someone said, well, why don't you learn this technology? I, I'd want to say, well, how long, how big's the industry and what's it, what are its prospects? And if I got an unsure answer, I could... industry, it needs to have be able to have early discussions. And I think there needs to be a strategic view to say, this industry wants to achieve X, Y, and Z. And obviously, you know, this is a parochial view from the steel sector. I would say that this, of course, wouldn't I? But from the steel sector's point of view, we, we view that you should be aiming to supply as much steel for this for these projects from the UK. Um, UK steel supplies, same as supplies all over the world, they really do rely on the opportunities and the contracts they have in their domestic markets more than the export opportunities. Those are the lucrative, high value, certain supply opportunities. And if you lose them, as we could do, as obviously North, Oil, North Sea Oil and Gas um, goes away if we lose that and it's not replaced by a new industry that does have an aim of supporting British manufacturing you could really lose that supply and those jobs and opportunities. Thanks Richard and I think that also sort of relates to this, this sort of cultural change that Kamal was <laughs> Now, it's going to be a long game. I recognise that. And there may be some people on this call uh, who believe that it's too premature for UKF um, to get involved. Well, frankly, even if it's no more than us raising awareness of our offer, then that's a step in the right direction in my book. Uh, so we are going to be taking this message um, on the road, so to speak. We are planning road shows across the UK, um, hopefully alongside uh, the likes of NP11, uh, to get the message out about what we can do and where we can support. Uh, but I, but I, I, you know, I do think that this collaboration between the, the public and private sector is absolutely key. Thank you very much, Richard. I think that was really, really helpful uh, and positive contribution. Would anybody like to come off their their camera and uh, come onto their camera, sorry, and, and give their comments or any further questions? So I, I'm going to come to Andy and ask him if he would like to provide some, some final reflections on everything he's heard and, and the reaction that his reports provoked. And there were some, and there were some chat, there was some chat that he's been answering around what is the relevance between nuclear and, uh, and oil and gas and things like that. But if just five minutes left. Um, I might ask Andy to just, just I think, respond to, to some of what you've heard since I haven't really given you a chance to do that yet. And um, yeah, just sort of uh, a bit of a sum up. Oh, we've got, sorry, we've got Andrew Etherington first. I'll let Andrew come on and then uh, you can sum up. Andrew. Yeah. Afternoon. I'm not sure if you can see my video because I'm not sure I can see myself. Yeah, we can. So Thanks. apologies, I've been merrily typing away and probably have got Andy a bit like, what's he talking about? I think perspectives. So we've been working with some of the clusters for the last couple of years. Um, in my previous career with the likes of AMEC, we were involved in CCUS. I think the, from the export that we talked about Peter Head and White Rose, we, we've done a lot of the engineering historically. And I think there was a great point made that we have the capability, we had a bigger capacity in the UK with oil gas chemicals. We've lost that a little bit. It's about how we start to bring it forward. My challenge to the group and to all of us is that some of the things we're talking about have already happening at pace. So if you read the current, the feed contracts, the studies, et cetera, a lot of this is already happening. So what we're seeing is very quickly a shortage potentially of major EPC contractors because they're all in the same lists. So they've got an engineering skill upskill challenge. 
the visibility of the supply chain starts to follow that. My observation is that I think there's a great opportunity for inter international collaborations around the technology because some of the technology companies are actually setting UK, UK bases. So how can we learn it? But just for my son's 18 and for the rest of us who've got family, it's about how do we find those skills which will survive? Because I think the risk is we've talked about a nuclear crew shrunk, oil and gas shrunk. It's about how we 